After an hour, I found on the forest floor the rinds and cores of durian fruit, which I knew was the favorite food of the orangutan. I showed it to the dyer who had come with me, and he confirmed what I had hoped. The way in which it had been chewed showed that it had been eaten by an orangutan. One must have been here early this morning. We looked up to see where the fruit had come from. And there, 50 feet above us, we saw a nest. Did one sleep there, I asked? Yes, he said, one was there last night. So the trail must still be warm, and the ape was probably quite close. A few minutes later, we heard a crashing in the branches ahead. And there, only a few yards away, we spotted a great furry red form swaying in the trees. Far from being frightened of our presence, he showed little inclination to dash away through the trees, but just hung there, screaming and breaking off branches to throw down at us. Sit down, keep quiet, and are patient, then animals will soon appear. These are among the loveliest and are certainly the most agile of all the forest animals, the acrobatic gibbons. It was early in the morning, just after dawn, and the gibbons were out looking for breakfast. Some fruit, flowers, or maybe a few bird's eggs. We kept absolutely quiet, and they didn't notice us, but hung a few yards away, eating in the treetops. But soon, one spotted us, and he raised the alarm. And then, with amazing speed and agility, the whole troop leapt away through the branches.
as he climbed the tree, we saw that he was feeding. His long, sticky tongue flickering over the branches, gathering the ants, which swarmed everywhere. Not a particularly pleasant meal, one would have thought, but at least his hard, scaly coat protects him from the worst of the, his stings. Without a regular daily supply of live ants, the pangolin can't live. We couldn't hope to provide him with the right sort of ants in London, so we didn't try to catch him, but just sat quietly and watched him as he continued undisturbed with his morning meal. We noticed that the ants on which the pangolin was feeding had constructed nests for themselves by fastening together clusters of leaves. There seemed to be a great deal of activity going on around these nests, so we looked closer. At first, we couldn't distinguish exactly what the ants were doing as they bustled about so busily. However, then we noticed this group with their jaws locked tight in the lower leaf and their hind legs attached to the upper leaf. The colony is constructing a new nest and these patient workers are holding two leaves of the future nest in position so that other members can fasten them together to form the outer wall of their new home. In the early evening, without warning, two men walked down the gallery and began to beat on the huge drums. S soon, a dancer wearing a headdress of hornbill feathers emerged from beneath the longhouse and began to prance and posture to the music of the drums and gongs which came echoing from the longhouse. Another masked figure came out to join him. Watched by the entire village from the gallery of the longhouse, a whole troop of men came out to dance around a newly erected totem pole. Now comes the Barong's main antagonist, heralded by two attendants. Rangda, the dreaded evil witch.
The Barong approaches her and now begins the fight. The men from the village, in a state of trance, rush down from the temple, waving their swords to attack Rangda and protect the Barong. But Rangda, by her evil power, is able to hold them at bay. Suddenly, with a flourish of her magic cloth, she forces them to turn their daggers upon themselves. The men, almost insensible, try to thrust these sharp swords into their chests. But the Barong's power is stronger than Ranga's, and he is able to protect his followers so that their swords do not pierce the flesh and no blood is shed. Now the priest comes from the temple and scatters holy water to bring the men out of their trances. The men rush back into the temple. The barong disappears, and all that is left are the mangy curs eating the priest's offerings to the gods. Not being able to get inside to the smell which was attracting him, he came round to the front. But now he caught a whiff of the smell of the suspended bait. I hadn't reckoned on him being so big, and to our dismay we saw that he could reach this hanging bait. But fortunately, he couldn't get enough to satisfy him, and he retreated with some of the goat's intestines dangling from the corner of his mouth. And down came the door. Hastily, we piled boulders on the door so that he couldn't lift it up. We had got him. And we thought our troubles were over. We had filmed him and we had caught him. But we reckoned without one thing. Unfortunately, in the end, bureaucracy defeated us and we weren't given a permit to export those dragons from Indonesia. So I'm afraid they're still there. That was the end of our zoo quest.